gentlemen, please have a seat. Wow, what an amazing God, huh? Amen. Oh my gosh, he's calling somebody right now. I can hear him calling. You better answer that up. Wow, you know, it's great to see everybody. You know, um, and there's a lot of people on the roads right now, uh, as you know, some of you who came on those roads. So, uh, Lord, I want to pray for all those who are traveling. Give them traveling mercies, Father, and give them peace right now. Mm, really give them that peace, especially with the guy in front of them. And we're asking for just your mercy on us, that we're going to open your, have our eyes open to what you have for us, each and every one of us this weekend. May we walk out of here more transparent, so that somebody looks at us and sees more of Christ. That's what we want. We want to get less of us and a whole lot more of you. And we ask this through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Wow, it is really great to have you guys. Really great. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot that goes on in putting together a weekend like this. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a lot of work. Planning, there's a lot of the uh, contacting and coordinating and purchasing and thinking and praying, and then there's some more praying, and then there's a lot of praying that's been done. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, ahead of time who has worked so diligently putting this weekend together. You know who you are, and God keeps the score. Amen? Amen. However, I do want to thank specifically, a uh, huge thank you goes out to Reverend Victor Gluckin, who put this thing together. We really do appreciate you, Victor. You know, and as difficult as all the business and the planning and the this and the that is, uh, it's, it's really not the most challenging part of a weekend like this. The most challenging part of a weekend like this is the theme. <laughs> right, Vince? What's the theme? I mean, it became almost like a running joke where every time Charlie or Victor or I would speak with each other. I mean, this was for a month. And, and I'd be, so dude, what's the theme? He goes like, <laughs> then he'd be like, he'd call me and, hey, Pan, did you check out on the weather forecast? And by the way, what's the theme? You know, and this would be, oh, and Charlie, hey, did anybody ask Charlie what the theme is? So, we, I mean, we had a vote. You know, we asked everybody in the church. <laughs> Point is, it's challenging trying to decide what the theme of a wonderful gathering like is, this is. And we really don't have a bunch of cards with ideas that we put in a hat and pick out every year. You know, we, we really want to, to seek the Lord. And, uh, and we did a lot of praying and we did a lot of talking in our attempt to do uh, exactly that. You know, because the question is, what does the Lord want, right? What does the Lord want? And one thing might be just the right thing for this group, but maybe not what this group needs. And, and maybe, maybe somebody is further along in their walk with the Lord over here. So what do we teach that would you know, help them as well as the person maybe who just said, you know what, let's see if God is real. We're not even sure about that part yet. So you know, we could teach on so many different things here. Yeah, we could teach on prayer. We could teach on the joy of service. We could teach on the walk of faith. I mean, we had all kinds of, we, the 846 scriptural uses of the word dirt. You know, we could have taught on anything. And somebody would have gotten something out of that if you're a horticulturist. I, I don't know. So, so we were, you know, it's like, Lord, we're after something greater than that. You know, we're, we're after something that is really going to encourage all of us, each and every one of us, something that is going to answer the question no matter what the question is. You know what I mean? What is the one, no matter what question you could ask, what is the one answer no matter what the question is. And that's really what we're trying to, to get to tonight. And part of that challenge, of course, is that we all come from different places this weekend. You know, we're all dealing with different things in our lives. So our prayer is that God meets you here. That God meets you here. Because no matter what the question is, the answer is the same. It's God. I don't care what the question is, what the issue is, where you are in your life, where are you, what do you need more of no matter who you are, no matter where you are seated here tonight, no matter who walks through that door, the answer is still the same for every single one of us. And it's God. It's God. 
That's what we need to be seeking more of. I'll tell you what, if you seek after God, he will find you. He will find you. And we're all God seekers here. Otherwise, why did you do 10 hours in a car? I mean, that's my idea of the seventh circle of hell is 10 hours in a car. So you guys get a special blessing this weekend. That's right. The longer the drive, the more the bless. Victor and Jess, you get nothing. They live, uh, never mind. So, you know, we need more of God. We don't need more of the world. Anybody got enough of that? Okay, we don't need more of the world because the, the world, it's like packing peanuts. You know what I mean? The styrofoam peanut things, they're not real. You know, they, they just... You could just eat a lot of those, and you'd think you, you would be full, but you'd have absolutely no nutritional value, amen? That's kind of like the world. The world does the same thing. It fills you with stuff, but it takes the God-shaped hole and it shoves packing peanuts in it. You know what I'm saying? Or Chinese food. <laughs> it's like, the world is like Chinese food. You, no matter how much of it you eat, why are you hungry an hour later? <laughs> I don't get that. I don't know if that happens to anybody else but me, but it's like, dag, man. What? It's only 6 o'clock? I'm starving again. So I think that we all agree that in order to get more of any one thing, something generally has to go. Agreed? or someone has to go. There's a really smart guy who said the, the following. He said, two objects can't occupy the same space at the same time. OK? I always thought it was, what's his name, Einstein, but it really wasn't. He wasn't that bright. A really smart guy named Wolfgang Pauli, who was an Australian Swiss physicist, figured that out. And the phrase is often used to indicate that when two objects are forced together, something has to yield. You get it? You can't, you can't, you know, this can't occupy the same space as this. If this is, you know, this pushes, then this, something has to go. Two, two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Something has to yield. Now, we're all pretty smart folks here. It's amazing to me that we haven't figured that out yet. Okay, because most of us want our cake and eat it too, right? Um, when if you had your cake and you ate it, would there be any more cake left? Okay, what a stupid expression that one is then. <laughs> yes, of course I'm going to eat the cake. I want my cake and I, whatever. These are the things that keep me up at night. It's exp <laughs> expressions like that. Here's an even better quote by an even smarter guy than Wolfgang. No servant can serve two masters. Oh, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus was a pretty smart guy too, huh? And you can quote him on that. Now, I want to I want to talk for a minute about serving two masters. Okay, has anybody here ever been a waiter? I don't know, is anybody over 18? Everybody on the planet, is, that was our first job, right? You know, as a waiter or something. So if, if you have, um, if you have two, two masters and you're trying to serve, it's like, okay, well, I have tables over here. Oh, darling, so nice to see you tonight. And then I have, I have these wonderful guys. Oh, and I have to, I always, always, and this, I would be a Spanish waitress for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Eduardo. <laughs> so, who's my master? Well, Eduardo, you know, I'm waiting on him and I'm waiting on them over here. Now, honestly, you know, they like totally different stuff than they do, all right? So I have to try to figure out how, and, and you know what, and you know, do you notice that everybody comes in at the same time? So everybody sits down at the same time. You're sitting there going, oh, la, 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 la. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's like 20 tables, right? And you have to wait on every single one of them. So now I've got Eduardo over here. i got Alyssa over here. And boy, is she tough. <laughs> so, and they're both going, excuse me, go ahead. Go ahead, excuse me. Psst. 
You, with your hand. Excuse me. Wow, she's easy. I'm going to have to find a harder customer. The point is, oh, oh, what can I get you? Oh, you wanted, you wanted water? OK, I'll go get it. And then you're being nasty. Oh, oh, hurry up. OK, what did you want me? Oh, more water? Oh, your soup is gone. OK, and what did you want? You wanted dessert. 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 You didn't even eat your supper yet, huh? <laughs> and what do you want? So it's getting ridiculous. And I will be so stressed. And if this has ever happened to you, you're so stressed. Anybody have more than one child? I mean, it's just, you know, same kind, right? You know, you cannot serve two children. Either you will hate the one. Wait. <laughs> I only had one. He's lucky. <laughs> Look, what is the point of all this? You know, when you're torn between two things, you totally get stressed out. And, and you know what? You're really unable to do either well, amen? amen. So you kind of got to gotta pick. And, and, and we've got to pick. And because something has to give. I want to show you something. This is, this is one of the greatest records I've ever seen scripturally about this concept that two objects, two things cannot occupy the same space. And um, if you have a, a, a Bible, pfft, yeah, right. <laughs> if you have a phone that you didn't turn off yet, you can take your phone and turn to Second Chronicles, please. <laughs> it's just so weird. Second Chronicles, chapter 5. OK, this is awesome. Now, let me set you a little bit of the stage. Here's what's going on. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 5. It's up here if you uh, left your phone at home. What's going on right now is in, in Israel, they were, had just finished building. Solomon had, had just completing the temple. And they, they've been working really hard on this thing. And, and they've been following the Lord um, in his design. They had, this is when... When Israel had their head right, okay, they were doing pretty darn well here. Their hearts were to, to follow what the Lord told them to do. So here they are at this big party, a lot bigger than tonight. Big, big dedication of the temple. Now watch this. In unison, when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and glorify the Lord, kind of like, you know, this is like the praise band is like kicking. And when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, what were they doing? Praising, Praising the Lord. Lord. Okay. What were they saying? He indeed is good. Let's say this together. He, he indeed, indeed is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. That was pretty cool. Then, next word. T-H-E-N, then. It means after something happens, right? When after one thing happens, something else happens? They had their hearts right, man. They had their heads on straight. And look what happened then. Then, this is so cool, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled what? Cloud. So the cloud was the glory of the Lord filling what? Cloud. So let me say this in simple terms. When God fills a house, there ain't no room for you. Okay? When God filled this house... The, there was no need for the priests. They, it said they couldn't even minister. And these dudes had it together. These dudes were holy dudes. These were all the ministers that were, were ministering to the Lord. And they were, had been doing their job and they're doing the right thing. But it, when, the, when God Almighty shows up, something's got to go. And instead of the place where they were ministering, came the glory of the Lord. 
And the glory of the Lord so filled the house of God that there was no need for them. When God fills a house, there's no room for you. And isn't, isn't that why you're here? Isn't that what you want? I mean, seriously, isn't that what you want? You don't want to half-bake this walk with God, do you? You know, you're, you want to be filled. I know I do. I want to be filled more and more each year. Hey, how about more and more each week, more and more each day, so that I can be more and more effective for the Lord's work, so I can be a greater blessing to my brothers and sisters, so I can be a greater light unto this messed up world we live in. They were dedicating a house that would be used to worship God, to meet the people's needs, to see answered prayer in this temple. Are you ready to dedicate yourself? Are you ready to dedicate yourself and to say, you know what, God? There's been way too much of me. Of course there's no room for God. If we're so full of ourselves, why do we get shocked if God doesn't take up all those places in our hearts and in our lives? He can't because two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. You cannot serve two masters. These guys, the Lord's ministers, as holy as they were, nothing compares to the glory of God. Nothing compares to the presence of God Almighty. They had nothing compared to that. They were not necessary because God is enough. God is enough. This next verse we're going to look at, you guys have... I hope, I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's, it's a simple verse, and it says that without faith it's impossible to please whom? God. Well, because he who comes to God must believe that he what? Is. That he is. I mean, let's just start there. More of God in my life. He is, and he's the one who rewards. He, it says, is the rewarder of those who will do what? See, no matter what the question is, no matter what you're looking for, God is the answer. You may say, well, well, I really need, you know, I'm looking for a relationship, I'm looking for a job, I'm looking for money, I'm looking, you know, no matter what you're looking for, God is still the answer. I'm looking for healing, I'm looking for, you know, uh, spiritual maturity. Give me any, any question that you could possibly ask and tell me that God isn't the answer in your life, in all honesty. That's honest, is to say, I need you. I need more of you. And to do that, something's got to go, and it's probably going to be me. But God rewards that. I believe that you're going to be rewarded by God Almighty because you're here. Why? Because it's such an awesome place? Because we got the best burgers and, you know, what? No. Because you're seeking God. That's, it's that easy. I don't care where you are from. What, you know, it, all that matters is where you're going. And if you're seeking God, he who does the rewarding, isn't that awesome? God is going to find you wherever you are. You must... You know, whether you're a tree, you know, maybe you've been serving for 40, 50 years. Maybe you're just trying to figure out, you know, do I want to keep doing the God thing? Well, if you seek him, he'll tell you. And he will reward you for asking him. And I think that we, we confuse that the things that God gives us, we, we look for them from other places, don't we? There are God things that only God can give you. Nobody else can give those things to us. Agreed? You know, but I think we look for God things in, in the church. The church is not God. I think we look for God things from other people. 
And I think we look for God things, things that can only come from God in the world, in other secondary pursuits. And you and I know you will only be disappointed. Only, always, and utterly disappointed when we look anywhere else but from God, when we seek any, from any other source other than our God. Jesus was very clear when he said, ask, and it will be what? <laughs> seek, and you will what? Knock. Knock, and it will be? For everyone who asks does what? Oh, man. Either he knew what he was talking about or he didn't. I believe Jesus knows what he's talking about. He says, if you will ask, you will receive. And when you seek, what are you going to do? You're going to find, and to him who knocks, guess what? It's going to be opened. All of these are... All of these are predicated that you're asking the right person, okay? All of these are saying, who are, who are you supposed to be asking? God. Who are you supposed to be seeking? God. You know, where are you supposed to be knocking? On whose door? God's door. That's when these things are a guaranteed no-brainer. It's really, I know it sounds simple, but it is. It really is that simple. But these are, these are heart Issues, a wholehearted pursuit of God is the only pursuit that won't disappoint you. Look, turn in your Bibles to Romans. Romans chapter 10. And read these, read these verses with me. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth who? Jesus as what? Lord. Define Lord. Give me some, some synonyms. Boss. Boss. Master. Master. Chief. 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 Oh. What? Authority. Uh, oh. Authority. King. King. Lordship. This is Lordship here. You, who is, you're confessing, you're saying that who is Lord? Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Well, Who's been Lord up until this point, maybe, in your life? Me. Right. OK. So again, can those two occupy the same space? No, no smart people. You're all a bunch of spiritual physicists. <laughs> That's what we want to be. We need to recognize that. Hey, man, you know what? Maybe I'm not being rewarded because I'm not seeking to fill these holes with the right stuff that's all packing peanuts and Chinese food and <laughs> soup with little floaty things in it. I don't even know what that stuff is that I eat when I go there. If you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. Well, I'll tell you what. Say from what? Uh, let's start with me. I'd like to be saved from that. I'd also like to be saved from myself. Seriously. Because myself is the problem. I want to be saved from the world. I want to be saved from my association with the world. You know what I mean? I want to be saved. I want to be made whole. I want to live for him with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I shared a few weeks ago, we all know that's the first commandment to love who? God. With all of your heart, your what? Your mind and your strength. But he's not the only one who wants those things from you, OK? The, the world wants those same things from you, your whole heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. you got to pick. You are the deciding vote here. you got, you know, two ways, one for, one against. It's a tie, unless you choose Christ. And when you choose Christ, you always win. You always win. There is no downside to what we're saying here. There's no downside to choosing to serve with your whole heart. If you have never decided that you need a new Lord in your life, this could be a weekend that you trade up. And those of us who have been around for a while, when we're honest, 
there are still areas in our lives that we refuse to give up lordship. Amen? Areas that we still think we can handle, areas that we still want to remain in control of, areas that we will not let go. And I will promise you that if you were examine your life, those are the areas that you get beat. Those are the areas where I get beat, are the areas I lose in the areas where I will not relinquish lordship. Because it hurts to die. It hurts to die. Nobody wants to die. It's not a fun process. You know what? But that kind of defines Christianity. When you really think about it, kind of defines Christianity. Because Jesus says to his disciples, now, what's a disciple? Uh, yeah, just anybody? A disciplined follower? A, dis a, a disciple is somebody who, are they serious about this? OK. This is the qualifications that we're going to read of what it is to be a disciple of Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, oh, wait, 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 hold on. Let's, I can't even get past that. You know why? Because I don't want to come after Jesus. I'm going to walk in front of him. That's right, because I'm going where I want to go when I want to go there. Wait, wait, where's Jesus in all that? He's somewhere back there. I left him in the dust. Amen? Okay? So we're looking at the qualifications to go into <coughs> disciple school. If we don't get this commandment down, there's a whole lot of lessons we're never going to learn. This is the fundamental and basic tenant, the basic requirement to go to Jesus school. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Well, spiritual physicists, <laughs> of course. Of course. Why? Because two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Amen? So you understand why? D did Jesus know this? Oh, yeah. So this is, you get this? This is what's, you know, people, the room gets really quiet wherever you put this verse on a wall. It does, it does. People just are like, don't. You know, it's like, because we don't like this one. This one's, going, this one's you know, grating against us. Why? Because self wants your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, just like God does. Okay? And self is fighting right now, right now, to say, oh, no, you ain't getting rid of me that easy. Really, self? I'm trading up. I'm going to Jesus. OK? Now, here's, here's what it looks like. If anybody wishes to come after me, you know what the word wishes means? Wants. The first requirement to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is volunteerism. You got to want to do it. This isn't a decision that anybody can make for you. Some people are disciples by the will of others. Oh, you know, when I grew up, I had a drug problem. My parents always drug me to church. <laughs> Put a punch. <laughs> Just getting that? <laughs> oh, man, it's a slow crowd. <laughs> drug problem. I went to church. Because I wasn't a volunteer. I, I was held captive, man. You know what I'm saying? Some, some of you may be here because that person, you need to, you know, they, they, you got in the wrong car. I don't know. You, they, <laughs> 10 hours. Wow. <laughs> the point is, volunteer. Jesus wants you to follow him because you make that choice. Nobody else can make that choice for you. Your husband can't. Your children can't. Your grandma can't, much as she tried. 
Okay? You got to make the choice. He must come after me. That means Jesus goes and you come. He must deny himself. Okay. What a great truth. I know this sounds a little confusing on the surface, but we're going to take, you know, break this down just a little bit. This law of discipleship that Jesus is laying down here. It seems like it's the same thing over and over again. Or, or come after me, follow me. Doesn't that seem like they're the same things? There is a difference between to come after and to follow because basically what it's saying is you may start that way, but you've got to complete it. You've got to finish it. You have to, if you're going to come after Jesus, you've got to keep following. You've got to keep following. And it says that we have to deny ourselves. And only when we deny ourselves can we persevere in a pursuit of God. Does that make sense? We cannot pursue persevere in our pursuit of God if we refuse to deny ourselves. That's not some religious hard saying, dude. That's just making sense. Lordship is not about, you know, going to church and, and, and retaining lordship of your own life. Now there is, that's being done by a lot of people. They're not here. You're here. You're here because you don't want to have these constant labor disputes with the Almighty. You want to know, God, what's your job and what's mine? My job is to follow. His is to lead. You, you get it? But, you, but do your job. Follow, follow. Deny. And the only way it's going to happen is if we deny ourselves, our own desires, our own plans, our own ways of doing things. And I know this is hard, but you know what? All the disciples and followers of Jesus Christ must deny themselves. We ain't going to learn the rest of the lessons if we can't wrap our brains around this. What other lesson are you going to learn if this isn't the first and fundamental? How about the law of love? Are you going to love your enemy? Think about it. If you don't get this denying of self, are you going to love an enemy? If you don't get this law, this, you know, this admission into the, the Christ school of putting one thing away so you can have something in its place, are you ever going to get the law of giving? Why would you give? Because it, if it's still about me, I would be really stupid to do so. Amen? Would you, will you get the lesson of serving if we don't get this lesson? No, that would be a waste of my self time, right? It's not a waste of my God time. If it's all about God, serving will come naturally. If it's all about God, giving will come naturally. Serve, you know, whatever, whatever God puts before you. If it's all about self, the only thing that's going to come natural to you are the things that already do that you're trying to get rid of. Yes, fish will come naturally. Selfish. Oh, man. So bad. Selfish. Get it? Oh, you guys, I'll tell you what. Oh, it's been a long, long drive, Pam. It's a long drive. Now, look, it says that we are to deny ourselves. But, you know, why is that a bad thing? It's not denying yourself so that you can be empty. It's denying yourself so you can be full. Full of what? God. Right? Full, full of God. That's what we need. More God, less of you. Okay? Now, for this to happen, when you're trading up, you're getting a new Lord. That means his ways become your ways. Are they better than yours? Okay, his thoughts would become your thoughts. Hmm, who's are better? Yes. Okay, and his desires for me, aren't they going to be better than my own? Yes. Okay, so what am I losing here so far? What's the downside? I'm still waiting. Oh, wait, 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 dying. That's a downside. That's why the verse isn't done. For whoever wishes to save his life, I'm sorry, must deny himself and take up his what? Oh, man. And a hush fell over the crowd. The cross. The cross is put here for all 
of the tough choices and the suffering that Christians must face. It's not easy or it's not pleasant to die. To die to self is not easy or pleasant. It's not easy to do the right thing or merely just to not do the wrong one. And you may be ridiculed for not doing the wrong thing. You may find suffering because you choose to be not like self, but to be like Christ. But what he's saying here is that these difficulties and these hard choices, they're referred to as crosses for a reason. A cross alludes to, the, to dying, to death. Do you ever think of a cross and not think of Jesus dying? Christ was obedient to die to himself so he could live for God. Do you and I think it will take any less to gain the same end? We also have to crucify the things that keep us from having all of that God in our lives. There are some things that really and rightfully have to go. And Jesus says here, for whoever wishes, again, there's that, you know, in, that desire. Whoever wishes to save his life will what? But whoever loses his life for whose sake? That's right. Amen. You want a real life? Give up your inferior idea of what life is. It's inferior compared to the life that you find in Christ. That is a life worth living. That is a life fulfilled. You know, and I know that, that we're, you know, we're, we're back and forth, that, that we're struggling, even with the words that we're hearing tonight. You know, because we all have our own agendas. But I will say this. You're not alone. You have the resources of God Almighty. Heaven and earth is at your disposal when you choose. Why? Because if you diligently seek him, it says that God is the rewarder. You're not waiting on your church. You're not waiting on your ministers. You ain't waiting on uh, your spouse, your children, your job. You don't have to wait on nobody and nothing. Because nobody and nothing takes the place of God Almighty. In your life, in your choice now, don't walk out of here. Do not leave these grounds. We're going to have a spiritual physicist police out there who's not letting you go unless you leave something so that you, when you, you know, so that Monday you made some God room. You understand? Leave something here. Leave something that is in his way. And those of you who are out of town, it's great because it's way too far to come back for. So just leave it here. Go back your 10 hours. And then you'll have to think twice if you want to come back for that nonsense that's keeping God out of your life, OK? And uh, for those of you who are local, hmm, good luck with that. So <laughs> the point, you understand? God can be found anywhere if you'll seek him. Ask, seek, knock, it's all yours. It's all yours and the resources of heaven are yours if you will but ask. Lose your life for the Lord's sake and you will truly, you'll find the life that he intended for you. You'll find the life of service and of joy and of peace and things that you cannot find in a life lived for anything less. Colossians chapter 3 tells us that you are to set your mind on the things where? Above. Things that are above. <laughs> Not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died. Ooh, sound familiar? There's an assumption here that you've made the decision that we're talking about tonight. That you have said, I have been Lord, I will crucify 
my desires, my selfishness, and I will fill that God-shaped hole with the only thing that belongs there, and it is God. Then, as I keep my mind on things above and not on the earth, I recognize and see that I have died and that my life is hidden where? In Christ. And Christ, who is our life, when he is revealed, then you will be revealed also in glory. You know, when the, the temple was filled with the glory of God, there was no more room for the mere human being. There was no need for the mere human being because God is enough. And the glory of God, when Christ is revealed, when he comes back, the, not only the house is going to be full, but the whole world will be full of his glory. Lord, we ask that you would help us to start tonight. Lord, we ask that you would fill us, that you would inspire us tonight. And the rest of our time together, Lord, inspire us in our, in our every minute to make more room for you, to give up those things that are holding us back, to give up those things and those areas that keep us from being able to be filled with your presence. Thank you for being a holy God, a rewarder as we seek you. We can trust you. Thank you that we can trade our self for Christ. And I thank you in his name. Amen. 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 Ready? Yeah.